let's find alpha and lambda for the best performance. Well, the best performance I'm going to define by the best MAE. Once I have that, you can see, for example, IDX best is the 34th model that we built. Let's find in the grid what alpha and lambda were for that 34th model. Good, so as we tried to see in the graph, it did look like the brown line reached the lowest point on the validation. The brown line was our Lasso model. Let's fit one final model then with these parameters. So 0 0.99 for alpha, lambda underscore equals 1, which doesn't sound like a very accurate kind of number. I'm sure we could do better than that if we tuned lambda properly now. Family equals Gaussian, link equals identity. We're going to train. We're going to train there are the independent variables that we've chosen previously, the sale price, and we're going to use all our train and validation data together. And finally, with our best GLM, we are going to make some predictions. Moment of truth. Are they any good? Train, eval. Now, what would you expect? about train and eval. Well, if those samples were large enough, you would expect performance to be roughly the same because they've both been used actually now in training our model, and we would expect the test performance to be worse because that wasn't used in our model. Right, so here we get our final results. Train and validation error are very close together, which is good. They should be because they were both used in fitting this model. Test error is disappointingly quite a lot higher, which is not a good place to be, but that is what it is. If I was being a bit more careful, I might choose a suboptimal model, so one which had a slightly worse validation error originally, but had less overfitting. Save the model, let's just finish off now. We're going to save the model, call it GLM best, store it in pdata in case we ever need this model again. Goodness, you can see where that's been stored, but hopefully it's been reflected on your local Dropbox. If you wanted to load the model in future, that would load the model back into GLM Best. I'm not sure I'm going to require you to save or load models, except I might need that for your assessment. Creating some predictions. I'm going to call the model 1A. I'm going to save these predictions in a dictionary. The dictionary contains the data frame itself, and information about what model 1A is, and finally, the path to that model. We haven't talked about variable importance yet, but it's almost such an obvious term. It means which variables are important in your model. H2O has a method called standard coefficient plot. Right, sorry. What we're printing here is the largest coefficients standardized, and that gives you an idea of which variables are important. It's not actually what people normally refer to by variable importance, which we'll discuss later. I don't like the fact that the largest magnitude model is whether or not the neighborhood is Stonebridge or not. Typically, when I see categorical variables, one level of a categorical variable having high importance, I'm a little bit worried that we've overfitted somewhere. It'll be interesting to see when we do other model types, such as random forests, if we get the same kind of result. Now, we use splines. We split our numeric variables up into little bits of straight line. This code here, which is somewhat painful, just tries to show you what the final fitted effect is for one of these splines, which I've chosen living area. The main thing I wanted to show you here is that you can see quite clearly how the final fitted coefficients are little bits of straight line. By the look, there's a kink over there, one over there, one over there. I actually just had a quick look at lot area to see if that looked any different or any more convincing. Once again, you can certainly see that the elastic net regression has taken the opportunity of these linear splines to fit a very non straight line all the way through. It's not obvious from all these dots that we actually needed that, but if you remember when we looked at the mean effect by lot area, it was very nonlinear, and hopefully this is picking up the effect. That is 
all I really wanted to say for now about elastic net in H2O. You've seen how to do a grid search manually. We're now going to move on to logistic regression. And when we do that in H2O, we'll probably use the built-in grid search and we'll also probably use the lambda search. One thing I should point out, what do you think will happen if we leave this Python session? We shut down our kernel, restart the kernel. You could press that button over there to restart your kernel. What do you think will happen to your Java virtual machine? Nothing will happen to your Java virtual machine. It will continue being there, running in the background, waiting to be connected to by another session. That's not really a great idea because it continues to use resources on your virtual machine. Now, of course, if you shut down your virtual machine, I don't really think that's particularly healthy either because you're then shutting down a Java virtual machine without shutting it down nicely. It's a little bit like pressing the off button on your laptop for eight seconds until that turns off your machine. It works, but it's not necessarily a great idea. So I would recommend you do this each time when you're leaving Python. That is it now. I will see you soon.